The Non-Religion in a Complex Future Project, or the NCF, is a seven-year international, interdisciplinary research project that explores the rapid rise of non-religion in seven research sites around the world. Canada, the United States, Argentina, Brazil, the United Kingdom, the Nordic countries, and Australia. The number of people who identify as non-religious in these countries has increased dramatically in recent years, in some cases overtaking the religious population entirely. Furthermore, in all of these countries, younger people are even more likely to identify as non-religious, suggesting that the non-religious population will continue to grow. The NCF is led by eight co-investigators under the direction of Lori Beeman at the University of Ottawa. Let's meet the team. I'm Lori Beeman. I'm the principal investigator of the Non-Religion in a Complex Future project. Hello, my name's Professor Douglas Ezzi uh, here at the University of Tasmania in Australia. My name is Inge Purset and I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Oslo, Norway. My name is Juan Marco Bazzone. I am currently working as a professor of sociology at the National University of Córdoba and as a full-time researcher at the Argentinian National Scientific and Technical Research Council. I'm Linda Woodhead. I'm F.D. Morris Professor at King's College, London. I'm Paolo Montero. I'm a full professor at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, my name is Peter Beyer. I am a retired professor of religious studies at the University of Ottawa. My name is Ryan Cragen. I work at the University of Tampa, which is located in Tampa, Florida in the United States. Hi, my name is Solange Lefebvre and I'm a full professor at the University of Montreal at the Institute for Religious Studies. The Non-Religion in a Complex Future Project is unique in that it studies what non-religion is rather than what it isn't. Typically, social scientists have studied non-religion like this. But this approach doesn't tell us much about what non-religion is. The non-religion in a complex future project aims to change that. Who are the people who self-describe as non-religious? What captures their imaginations, their passion, their time, their energy? How are social institutions changing as a result? What new rituals and practices are emerging? The NCF has five focal areas, education, environment, health, law, and migration. These are areas of social life where religion has historically played a significant role, but which are not explicitly religious. Nested within these five focal areas are seven subprojects, with even more to come as the project progresses. How do we teach religion in diverse societies? Community gardens? Experiencing nature during physical activities or the trekking project? Death and dying? Legal constructions of non-religion? The cultural and social values survey? And the reception of non-religious refugees? Today, the NCF team will give you an overview of each of these sub-projects, beginning with the cultural and social values survey. Does or did religion do anything that is essential for, shall we say, living well together, for a satisfactory and meaningful life, for a good society? If so, what are those things? And how might one do them in a way that is not religious, that is non-religious? The Cultural and Social Values team has developed a survey to identify the positive content of non-religion. That is, what non-religion is, rather than what it isn't. The idea in, all, in the entire project is not to use religion as the measure of where to look. We're not looking for a replacement for, relig for religion so much as for something that may have always already been there in people's lives and that religions have historically and today also served to address or fulfill. But that, does, that doesn't form or appear as religion. The Cultural and Social Values team is conducting their survey in eight countries around the world, including Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Finland, Norway, the United Kingdom, and the United States. In their survey, the Cultural and Social Values team asks about how people feel and how they act in areas like environment, education, law, and health, for instance, what they think should be taught in schools, what it is that is imp most important to teach their children, and what they think about the food we eat and how it is produced, what their relationship is to nature, what they're willing to contribute to make the world a better place or to solve social problems, what they do in the face of crises, personal and otherwise, and so on. 
So schools are obviously really important when you're thinking about where religion and non-religion really makes a difference. We really try to understand how religious diversity, including non-religion, has influenced the way religion is seen and taught in schools. How has religious education in historical Christian majority countries change in the context of increasing religious diversity? We also want to understand how does religious education in this context take non-religious into account. The education team has multiple research projects underway, including analyses of school websites in Canada and England, and a case study of innovative teacher training curricula in the state of Paraná in Brazil. These projects consider how the good citizen and common ground through shared values are imagined in these different contexts, what is considered acceptable as non-religion or religion, and how non-religion, religion, and values intersect. Partly because of COVID, but it's really turned into a blessing, we started by using online materials. In the UK, we're very lucky because all public schools, all that is all state-funded schools, have to have a website. The UK team assembled a large random sample of school websites and is exploring how these schools represent religion and non-religion in their online materials. And of course, we look at the content of the religious education lessons, what's being done in them. And finally, we look at their selection criteria. The Canadian team has taken a similar approach and is analyzing their data based on five themes. Religion, spirituality, value, diversity, and school's objectives. We do not have firm conclusions yet because the research is ongoing, but we are already struck by the different combinations of values depending on the province and the private public distinction. Finally, the Brazilian team has turned their attention to teacher training curricula. In the case of Brazil, when analyzing the curriculum guidelines of the different states of the country, it was found that the state of Paraná stands out for proposing the official development of a non-religious religious education. How do non-religious worldviews shape our relationships with and everyday understandings of the natural world? Will the rise of non-religion dismantle the human nature hierarchy reflected in dominant religious discourses such as stewardship? Will this change the way people relate to the world around them, prompting action on issues such as climate change? The Community Gardens Project explores the relationships, human and non-human, that form through community garden initiatives and how religion and non-religion play out in their formation. How does growing food in a community garden shape the way that people think about ethics and their place in the world? I am personally interested in emerging discourses of equality. How, for example, are human beings talking about their relationships with non-human animals and nature in more egalitarian ways? For example, how do people think about garden pests? I'm fascinated by this. Possums in Tasmania, slugs in Finland, deer in Canada. Do these pests have a right to a place in the world, um, just not in the garden? Or should they have a share of the produce of the garden? How do we think about these things? These are deeply ethical questions that cut to the heart of what it means to be human in our place in the world. The Trekking Project examines the experiences that people have while trekking, that is hiking, walking or rambling, and how they make sense of them. We are interested in how experiences in nature are related to or influence people's worldviews. For instance, do people who hike in environments that have limited evidence of human activity report different experiences and feelings than do those who hike or walk in environments that have buildings, roads, trash, or graffiti? But we're also interested in exploring the worldviews of people without asking them what their worldview is. We've conducted a survey in all our countries, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Finland, Norway, UK, and the US, it's just wonderful. And we've been interviewing about 20 um, people who trek, hike, or bushwalk in each of those countries. In the trekking project, we can ask questions like, how do you interact with non-threatening animals? And we are learning that many people attempt to communicate with animals, often expressing a sense of connection with, respect for, and caring about animals. 
When people discuss their interactions with animals, they often reveal how they think about non-human animals relative to humans and whether they frame that as a hierarchy or as a more egalitarian relationship helps us understand their worldview. What does it mean to talk about death without referencing an afterlife or a transcendent being? What meaning, practices, and rituals are associated with death outside of the context of religion? The Death and Dying Project explores how the shift from religious affiliation to non-religion may reshape understandings of the meaning of death, narratives and practices around dying, and legal approaches to issues such as medical assistance in dying. We study changing practices related to death, including the rise of environmentally friendly burials, death cafes, which are non-religious spaces to talk openly about death, and changing narratives about death in obituaries. We're also considering what a good death looks like in the context of non-religion by exploring palliative care and medically assisted dying through both social and legal lenses. In historically Christian uh, majority countries, many of the social and legal institutions have been shaped by the Christian doctrine. Consider the same sex marriage debates. Some religious opponents of same-sex marriage argue that marriage was a religious institution. Being defined by God, it could not be changed because it predated civil society. This argument can be described as what some people might depict as natural law position. But in an increasingly non-religious society, what role does religion play in law? As we move to a more diverse society that includes a significant number of people who are non-religious, how does law as a social institution change? How do legal decisions reflect shifting norms and values? And how do social actors reflect those changes? The law team explores how religion and non-religion are constructed, that is, defined, represented, and applied through the lens of public and legal controversies over issues including same-sex marriage, reproductive rights, and medical assistance in dying. A central concern for the research is to consider who uses religious on a non-religious language and when, and also how people represent religion and non-religion in this public controversies. Finally, we would also like to explore the collaborations and the conflicts between religion, non-religion and science, and also to consider how law change, shape and define these categories. In this focal area, we examine how immigrants and refugees are characterized whether they're characterized as religious or non-religious, both in the media, in policy documents, in political statements, and receiving groups. Is there a dominant attitude in receiving countries like Canada that migrants will conform to preconceptions of what migrants of different origins and backgrounds are like? Is there a tendency to mix national and ethnic identity with religious identity? For example, by assuming that refugees from a Muslim majority country are Muslim. What about the non-religious? Are they even recognized as such, let alone being able to live as such? How do migrants reconstruct and negotiate their non-religiousness in an environment where it may not be expected or perhaps even recognized? And do refugee receiving institutions or groups recognize non-religious identities at all. We are just beginning to collect data in this project by interviewing the leaders and administrative staff in refugee centers or organizations. We want to study how these organizations identify the religious and non-religious identities and needs of refugees and what they do to facilitate them. What we'd like to find out is how do these organizations conceive the people whom they serve? Do they recognize the non-religious migrants among them? Do they tailor their services to them the way they might tailor their services to religious people? 
How easy is it to be non-religious, a non-religious refugee who has received and receives services through such organizations? Now we're going to be interviewing those who staff and run these refugee service organizations and this in various cities across the country. We are unfortunately only at the beginning of this um, and uh, we don't have any results yet. We're just in the process of starting to collect data. The non-religion in a complex future team is forging new ground through its innovative research on non-religion. In our five focal areas, law, the environment, health, migration, and education, we move beyond none of the above to explore what non-religion is and how it's impacting the world around us. You'll find ongoing updates on our research results and upcoming events and workshops through our website and social media.